House Bill 425 by Representative Jackson. And it's a joint resolution proposing to add Article 1, Section 20.1 of the Constitution of Louisiana to provide that nothing in the Constitution shall be construed to secure or protect a right to abortion or require the funding of abortion. Senator Mizell. Thank you, Mr. President, members. Um, I stand here privileged to present this to this body. Uh, we hear all the time bills that come forward where we, uh, we worry about the numbers or we worry about, uh, we, I've heard the term subterfuge in this body. Today, you're looking at the simplest of bills. If I could share with you, the purpose of this bill would add to our Constitution these words. To protect human life, nothing in this Constitution shall be construed to secure or protect a right to abortion or require the funding of abortion. That would be on the ballot for the citizens of Louisiana to make that determination for our state. It wouldn't be judges in D.C., it wouldn't be people in D.C., it would be the people of the state of Louisiana determining what they thought about life. This is a strictly a straight up bill. There's no numbers to dispute. I see no questions. Any questions, of Senator Mizell? Any amendments? Yes. No. You do? Amendments by Senator Boudreau. Senator who? Boudreau. 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 Amendments by Senator Boudreau. They are set number 2149. Do we have them? A copy? There are. Okay. I got one. Uh, Senator Boudreaux. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, I rise in, in, um, okay. as a pro life advocate in, in support of this. The, my amendment basically changes the date from October 12th of 2019 to November 3rd of 2020, which would be in line with the presidential election. I've also spoke to Representative Jackson, and she supports this amendment. All right. Uh, Senator Walsworth, you got a question? I guess, Senator, I guess why? I mean, I can't think of anything more important than this constitutional amendment. And, and why put it off for another year? If you can just tell me why. So we figured with the, and I concur, this is very important, and I, as I said, I support it. What the intent is to have it in line with the presidential election and have hopefully a, a larger turnout and more people vote on it throughout the state um, and line it up with, with the, I mean, the numbers have proven that the presidential election turns out more. So we're talking about uh, delaying it another year. So um, I don't know that it negatively impacts anything or moves anything back or forward. So uh, that's the simple portion of the uh, amendment. We, we just want more. So we're going to put all amendments on the governor's, I mean, the presidential elections from now on? Is that where we're headed? Is that all constitutional amendments need to go on the presidential? Or is it just this one? I can't speak to all. I stood and I placed this amendment on this one. So, um, and this is the first one that I bring. So, this is my amendment, and I'm looking to move it back one. But I, I wouldn't put them all in the same category, and I wouldn't say that we would put them all on the presidential election. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, Senator Carter, you, you have a question? Senator, Senator Boudreaux, did you know that we put this same amendment on Senator Clayton's bill for the death penalty? Now that you bring it up, I do recall that. We put it on for similar reasons that we wanted to make sure that it got as broad a spectrum of participation from the electorate as possible. Did you know that? Thanks for reminding me. And now that you brought it up, we, had, we did that in this body. Thank you. Senator Cortez, you got a question? Uh, 
Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Boudreau, I know that uh, you are aware in Lafayette Parish with our change of governance, we're going to have two different parish councils. We're going to have a parish council, a city council. We have a sheriff's election. We have a mayor president that's going to have probably four or five people on it. We're all going to be on the ballot. The governor's going to be on the ballot. It's going to be a lot of statewide elections. My question is, where do constitutional amendments go on the ballot? And I know in our, in our parish, we're going to have a huge ballot in the uh, fall election. Would this, would this be, have a better presence in the, in the following election? Uh, where, in, and I don't know this in the statewide, I don't know if you've studied this, but in our area, during the presidential election, the only things that come up in our area are the outlying parish, uh, city, mayor's uh, elections. The school board is on our, our cycle. Uh, I guess what, I get, what I'm getting at is I hear people saying, I quit voting after I got halfway down, and if the constitutional amendment falls at the bottom of the ballot, I would like it to be on the least, uh, the ballot with the least amount of stuff on it so that people could vote for it. Yeah, that would be my concern. So tell me, did you do any research? Did you talk to them? There has not been any research on it, but I, I think your point is well taken that we know that this would be at the bottom of the ballot, at, at the list. So when you have a, a heavily populated agenda, most people will have fatigue, and by the time they finish voting on the first couple, it'll be done. So I think that serves as, a, as, a, as another example of why this would bring more recognition. It'll be higher um, the following year in the presidential election as compared to all of the statewide, all of the local elections that we already know is on the ballot in October at this point. So I would, I would strongly suggest that's, that's a, uh, an important factor in moving forward where it would not get lost and we wouldn't have a small percentage of people voting either way because of the fatigue. So, and I'm just curious, I did t try to text the Secretary of State, I, he hasn't responded, but I, I know he's busy as everybody else is, but I would want to know where on the ballots it would fall and how many, you know, in, in, the, in different districts it's going to be different, obviously, and if you have an opposed candidates, there could be many different factors, but during the presidential election, um, I know we have our congressional and you know elections that come up during that time, um, but I don't. I'm wondering how deep on the ballot constitutional amendments would fall. And I, I didn't know if uh, Representative Jackson had asked, you know, for this or, or where, what was going on with it. But anyway, I'll, I'll just listen to the rest of the debate. Thank you. Senator Barrow, a question. Senator Boudreau, did you speak with the author, Representative Jackson, about this amendment? Yes, ma'am, I did, and uh, she was fully supportive of the amendment and uh, didn't have any objection. Senator Clitty, you got a question? You have an objection. All right. Senator Long, you wish to floor on the amendment? Thank you, Mr. President. To delay this vote makes a much greater statement than to take this vote and bring it to our people. The fall elections in Louisiana are held every four years. There is a sense of expectation because the governor's race and the statewide races are being held. We need to vote today so that this measure can be added to the Constitution amendments, which will be voted on in October. There is no logic in waiting a year. Now, I appreciate Senator Boudreau, and I appreciate Representative Katrina Jackson, but I must tell you that there is no logic, there is no common sense as to why we would put this off a year. So I rise in opposition to the amendment I appreciate the fact that Senator Boudreau, like I am, is passionate for pro-life. But to delay this, it just doesn't make sense. All right. Senator Mizell, do you have any comment? Members, 
I'm carrying this bill for Katrina Jackson. She's in favor of it. Personally, I oppose the amendment because I agree with what's been said. This, this is something we need to vote on now. There is not one ounce of concern about people getting out the vote. I've been called every day about when we're going to be carrying this bill. People are waiting in, anticip in anticipation of this vote. So there, there's no issue there. And, and I agree. I, you know, my commitment to Representative Jackson was to follow her lead. And uh, she agrees with it. But personally, uh, I'm, I'm in deep conflict because I, I think the sooner we do this, I mean, the whole point of it is to, to do it as quickly as we can. Thank you. Um, Neil, any questions? Senator, Senator Carter, you want to ask a question? I, I, I listened with, with great attention as you very respectfully talked about the sense of urgency of letting the people vote on this. The sense of urgency of, of this issue that is so important that the people should weigh in on. Moments ago, we had another issue that I think is critically important that the people weigh in on. You know, somewhere along the line, when we have the discussion of pro-choice, pro-life, I think we miss the opportunity to say just because you're pro-choice doesn't mean you're anti-life. Just because you think a woman should choose doesn't mean that you don't cherish life. Just because you think that the legislature should not tell a woman what to do with her body doesn't mean that we don't cherish life and support life. At what point do we fight for life in the womb and fight equally as hard for it once they're born? At what point do we fight for life for parents who are trying to provide for their children and for their families by having and earning a living wage. Yes, I agree, there's a sense of urgency. And the urgency is for people to have an opportunity to weigh in on this measure, perhaps, but also on minimum wage. So my question, my final question, mm -hmm. why do you feel different, or do you feel differently? Do feel differently about that? We should have a vote for this uh, Constitution Amendment on House Bill 425, and should we also have a vote for Senate Bill 155 on minimum wage? I think we all have to look ourselves in the mirror and what, what our own conscience tells us. I don't question your conscience. You, you look yourself in the mirror and you answer to that. And, I, and that's where we are. I, it's one of those things that and, and, I, didn't, I don't have to argue this, Bill. We all knew when we walked in here today what our heart had told us. We all knew that. I'm just laying out what their next step's going to be. And this is why I say there's, we, we dispute dollars and, and economic impacts of things, and it becomes an individual decision. But you have your way of thinking. I have mine. I respect your way of thinking. My respect for the urgency here is in a different vein than, than minimum wage. And, and that's why I believe that we do need to do it as soon as we, it's not even whether we do it this year, it's, we, it's as soon as possible we do it. And, and, and this, again, it's the people of Louisiana who are gonna make the decision. But let's get that decision made. To be clear, if anything that I said was taken in a vein of disrespect no. to you or that I challenged your philosophy of what you think, no. that was not my intent. No. And if it was in any way taken that way, I apologize because that was not my intent. I would never challenge your philosophy or your position or what you believe in because I believe you're passionate about it and I respect that, as am I about issues that are important to me. But again, you just said it's important to let the people of Louisiana vote. That's all I'm saying. Thank you, Senator Carter. All right. Senator Fanning, you wish this floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, I rise in opposition to the amendment. I'll be brief. 
I don't come to this well uh, as, as, as often as many of you do. Let me just tell you, in my time, you know, looking at gubernatorial races and the years that we have them, we range somewhere in the neighborhood of 56, 57 percent. When you have a presidential election year, somewhere in the neighborhood of 61, a high number could be 63 percent. That's not much difference, ladies and gentlemen, because th this bill is going to pass no matter which year that you hold it on, but it's important that it passes this year from the standpoint that we don't need to put it off any longer. It's important. It was important to Senator Jack, I mean, Representative Jackson. It's important to each one of us here today. So I rise in opposition to the amendment. There's no need to, to put something off when we can do it today and, and it'll be done. So I ask you to, you know, to vote against the amendment and let's vote on the bill. All right. Senator Boudreau, you have a right to close on your amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, I, uh, I said at the onset, uh, as a pro-life advocate, I support this. This is, you know, this is the, the, the way that we take care of business. We have a representative who had a bill. I spoke to her about an amendment. She had no objection. You know, it's about the process at this point, of respecting the process now, I'm not trying to, to you know, if, if I was uh, against this bill and I came up and put an amendment on, then I think you can paint me with a brush that said I'm playing games. I'm not playing games. I'm saying up front where we are with this. Now, we all know what we have in place in this state. I'm not going to be part of that train that's trying to set, uh, keep up with Alabama and all these other states. To, who's going to be the, 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 the state that's so far off the wall that some of us can't look in the mirror and see that it pertains to us. So I'm, I'm just telling you that, that I put the amendment on because that's what I felt was best for us to do. And I'm not rushing into any judgment. I'm not running away from the issue. We have laws on the books today. It was said earlier, we put the same amendment on another bill. I'm not downplaying the importance of this. But I have a right to, to, to bring an amendment and put it on the floor, and we'll live with the results. But this is a constitutional amendment that won't undo anything that we're doing, won't delay anything that we're trying to do. But I'm not going to be part of the, the fanfare trying to get on the cameras, trying to say Louisiana has now outdone Alabama and all the rest of these states who are passing all these laws to get all of the attention. So I'll ask for your support of the amendment with the understanding that I believe in what I'm putting in here is something that's gonna help more people. It might be a small percentage, but it's people. And I think that's part of the process that we fail sometimes to respect that. Our time, this is a constitutional amendment that people will decide. We can decide when that date comes up. We're talking about an election in October. We're talking about an election in October. I'll stand here and tell you that people that want this, they, their mind is made up. But there's a lot of people who still don't understand everything that's going on. We can, we can, we can put it in a package and we can say this is another a bill that's going to move us so far to the left or so far to the right. That's, we should be about the people. So I ask favorable passage of the amendment. All right, gentlemen, it's sent up an amendment to which there's objection. Uh, when the machines are open, those of you in favor will vote yes. Those opposed, no. Secretary, open the machines, please. Vote your machines, please. Vote your machines. Are you through voting? Senator Martini, no. You through voting? I call them up, please. Nine yeas, 26 nays, the amendment fails to pass. Any further amendments, Mr. Secretary? All right. For the floor, Senator Gatti, you wish to speak? Thank you, Mr. President. Just honored to come up here today to support this bill. This is a big deal. I know many of y'all have been here a long time. You know, leadership is tough when it comes to an issue like this because we've had long debates all day. And one of my favorite stories from history is about the Conqueror Cortez as he headed from Cuba over to Mexico, and every other exploration before him had failed. 
So he unloaded the boats, he unloaded his men, and his first order was what? Burn the ships. And the reason he did that is because even though he had painted a picture of the great treasures of Mexico, he had fired up his men, he always knew that in the heart of man there's something called fear. And if you don't remove fear from the heart of a man, he will retreat. That's his nature. Let's not forget what this bill does. Let's not forget the, uh, the, the monumental ship that is being burned by this bill. To protect human life, nothing in this Constitution shall be construed to secure or protect a right to abortion or to require the funding of abortion. You know, we can all remember when we first found out that our spouse, that we were having that first baby. I remember Susan and I, she was in graduate school. We'd been married about three years and I thought, wow, let me say that backwards. Wow, we're having a baby. Had no clue what to do. I was full of fear, fear of changing diapers, fear of what's going on. I had a dream of having 10 boys because gaddies are pro-life and prolific. And here we are 20 years later with all girls. Fear sets in every day. And Catherine was born and we were on Medicaid. Our doctor sat us down and said, y'all are poor students, you can't make it. And we had a lot of fear. But Susan and I decided to burn the ship. We said, we're gonna reset everything. We're gonna do what needs to be done to raise this little girl. And it was a few years later when Susan was pregnant with our daughter Elizabeth that Catherine woke me up to go to church, this little two-year-old girl. This girl that I had feared in her in the world, she said, Daddy, let's go to church. She had her sandals on. She had her hair done. And she said, let's go. And I said, where are we going to sit? She said, I want to sit on the front row. And I'm like, I don't want to sit on the front row. And the preacher preached out of the book of Nehemiah. And he said, even children can lead people to Christ. And I said, well, today must be my day. So guys, I'll tell you, so many people are fearful of having these babies. Let me tell, just tell you some numbers. In 2017, what percentage of pregnancies in Louisiana do you think ended in abortion? 12.5%. Sixty-nine thousand pregnancies, eighty-seven hundred abortions in our state. So when we talk about the reasons maybe we should allow abortion to happen, let me just put that to rest. In the same year, only about eighteen hundred rapes were reported throughout our state. Only eighteen hundred. Now that's a big number. We should be scared of that. We should work on that. But twelve point five percent. 12.5% of our pregnancies ended in abortion. Many people have said, well, I think it's okay to kill a baby in the womb if there's something wrong with it. Well, let me tell you another story. You know, we had Rebecca, everything didn't go right. It didn't. The doctor made a little mistake that turned into a big brain injury. And sweet Rebecca never walked or talked on this earth. She had so many seizures that the doctors at Shriner said, do you know her hips are out of socket? And we said, yeah. They said, we're gonna rebuild her hips. And we said, she's not gonna walk. You don't have to do that for our trouble. And the doctor began to weep a little bit and he said, thank you. She never walked, talked on this earth. We fed her through a feeding tube. When she finally passed away and God took her home, all my daughters were at home. We all sat around there, and we weren't happy that she had left. This special needs girl, we had to hire somebody to live with us. It was crazy. And when I hear people say, you know, it's okay to kill a baby in the womb if there's something wrong with it, let me tell you something. That little girl that never walked or talked in our life brought a lot of people to meet Jesus. Had a lot of people think about what life is. I can't look at Fannin because he was at the funeral. But when people say there's something wrong with that child, let's get rid of it. I say, you don't know the blessing you're missing. We were at Dallas Children's one night. I don't like telling this story. 
She had so many seizures, just so many seizures, back to back to back. Finally, the neurosurgeon back home called me and said, look, her, her brain is so damaged that she's hitting a milestone. And her brain's not going to myelinate. That means the sheath around the axons and dendrites are not going to form. It's like a bunch of electrical cords spread on the ground. And they've been stripped of the insulation. So as th one thing fires, they all fire. What do we do? So she was sitting in this bed. Susan's hair was falling out. We were warming up breast milk, and we were feeding her like a baby bird. I'll never forget that night. The doctor walks in, and he says, well, we need to give her another shot of Ativan. I'm like, I don't know what that is. He said, well, here's the deal. If we give her another shot, her respiratory system may stop because she's so little bitty. He said, but dad, and they call you dad and mom at a children's hospital. I think that's their way of not getting too connected to you because most of the kids there pass away. He said, well, dad, if I don't give her another shot, she's going to die of a stroke. And I looked at Susan and I said, Whew. so I went to a little coffee room. It is about as wide as this podium. And I said, God, what do you want me to do? Because the doctor said, before I'll give her the shot, you have to sign a DNR. I'm like, what? We've been fighting for seven months just to keep her alive. And so with sleepless night on top of sleepless night, a one-day trip to Dallas turned into two weeks. We slept on those little plastic sofas in the room. I said, what do I do? Do I sign the DNR or not? And the message I got back was, if you sign it and it's not my will, I've already forgiven you. I don't know why things work out this way. I don't know why the darkest night I had with the toughest little girl I've ever had to raise, that's the one time God kind of winked at me with some wisdom. I wish he'd wink at me more when I'm sitting over here. But it's amazing that the fear of having children, this fear is running so rampant. So I'm not the only one that has walked the earth that has been fearful when they hear those words, y'all are pregnant. I can't imagine what folks have to go through when they think, well, maybe I'll just have an abortion. But leadership calls us today to get behind Katrina Jackson's bill. <laughs> to realize there's really no good reason to kill a baby in the womb. The womb should be the safest place for a baby. It really should be. So if you're out here and you're worried and you're thinking, I don't know what to do, kids come all the time unexpected. Kids come that are broken. People say all the time, really, God picked a great family to raise Rebecca. And I said, you know what he did? Susan uh, had to quit her job, her dream job. She had gotten her PhD in psychology and she was working at the children's clinic at the Health Science Center. And she called me and she goes, I can't go back to work. Can't go back. And I said, well, honey, you pray about it. If God leads you that way, you quit your dream job. She called me back five minutes later and said, okay, it's a done deal. I said, man, God talks to you a lot quicker than he talks to me. I thought, wow, that's our income. That's our insurance. A lot of fear. Two weeks later, the workers' comp judge, workers comp judge called me. He said, Gaddy, I know you haven't applied for this job, but the chief judge in Baton Rouge heard about you, and we want to give you this job. We want you to come apply. It was the same money Susan walked away from and the same health insurance. Another wink. Another wink. It's never okay. It's okay to have fear, but it's really never okay to get rid of the time-honored tradition that it is never okay to kill a baby in the womb. You know, guys, there's a lot that we can do to affect this number. There's a lot of things we could do. But I think it's time we bring our law in line with modern medicine. I was at a Washington, D.C. at a think tank, and they were talking about this issue. Both sides, pro-choice, pro-life. 
And the pro-choice guys, they couldn't figure out why the number of abortions was going down in a certain age group. And the pro-choice people would say it was because of Jesus. We got them. I was like, that can't be that. So they finally did a study, and they brought these young women in who should have had abortions, but they didn't. And they sat those young women down, and they analyzed them and talked to them. They asked them all these important questions about who they were and where they were from. And every one of them said this. And I want you to think about this. What's the first picture in your baby book? It's your picture after you were born, right? But this next generation, what's the first picture in their baby book? The sonogram. You see that? That age-old lie that that's just a mass of cells? No, their mom or their grandmom or their Mimi or their papa sat them down. They opened that book one night when they wouldn't sleep, and they said, that's when we first found out you were on the way. Well, how old was I? How much did I weigh? You weighed about four ounces. You were only about six weeks from conception when we found out you were coming. It's time that our law catches up with science. We don't need to lie to people anymore and say it's okay to kill a baby in the womb if there's special needs. It's okay to kill a baby in the womb if you can't afford it. We've got to stop lying to the people and tell them the truth. Now listen, some of you aren't going to vote for this bill, and I know that. And I respect that. There was a billionaire over in Texas, and he had a million acres, and he had billions of dollars. He had cattle everywhere. He had a beautiful young daughter, sweet little girl. She was 18. He wanted to find the proper man for her. All right? So he said, let's line them up and get them over here. And he filled his pool full of alligators and crocodiles and snakes and turtles. And all the young men lined up at one end. He goes, here's the deal. You'll have a choice. You can have $50 million. You can have 100,000 acres. Or you can have my daughter's hand in marriage. All you have to do is swim the whole length of the Olympic-sized pool. And before he could finish his sentence, he heard a splash at one end. And a young man got out the other end, wiping the water off. He said, young man, what do you want? What do you want? You want the 50 million? You want the acreage? You want the daughter's hand? You know, she's getting everything. He goes, no, sir, I want to know who the heck pushed me into the pool. <laughs> you see, I'm just trying to push some of you into the pool. I know it's going to be tough going back home. I'm asking you to swim with some alligators and make this tough decision. But 100 years from now, we're going to be somewhere. And wouldn't it be awesome to welcome these families where we are? Thank you, and I rise in support. All right, any other discussion? Senator Mizell, you have a right to close on the bill. In brief, just a closing comment. We've talked all day about being the voice of the voiceless. This is really an opportunity for the state of Louisiana to be the voice for the voiceless. So I appreciate passage. Senator Mizell, now moves final passage. Machines are open, those in favor, vote yes, those opposed, no. Vote your machines, please. Vote your machines. Vote machines. Dr. Thompson, you through voting? You through voting? All right, close them up, please. 31 yeas, 4 nays. The bill is final. Pedro, reconsider the vote. Let the motion have the next vote.